I am probably the least excited about TikTok. What does give me enjoyment is singing together. And so mm. it's very easy to just be like, well, what's our favorite thing to do? Freaking sing a song that we all love together. It's definitely just a job. Sometimes mm -hmm. you don't want to do it. Sometimes you don't want to show up at work, but like you just, you it's, clock you gotta clock in. It, even if you don't get the views on it when you post mm. it, it I, I think that that can really make it difficult to continue posting. But mm -hmm. if you have something that you can look back on and you're proud of and you want to show people, I think yes. it's worth it regardless. Also like a really good exercise for artists to be a little bit less precious about mm. the songs you do or the content you're putting out. This is just one thing I'm working on today. It doesn't have to be like, like the only thing that's ever gonna represent everything you do. And that we're not always great all the time. Like it kind of offers a little bit of real life to it. <laughs> What's going on? Welcome to the New Music Business. I'm your host, Ari Herstand, author of How to Make It in the New Music Business, the book, third edition, coming very, very soon. Look out for it. Today, my guests are the three women of Truesdale. They are a Los Angeles-based group, and they have impeccable, incredible uh, chill inducing three part harmonies on most of their songs. If that is your thing, I think you're really going to love their music. You should definitely, definitely check out their music. They also have a very impressive story of how they grew from zero to a million monthly listeners completely independently in just a year. And we dig into all of that, how that all happened, how they operated through the pandemic and their strategy on TikTok. Uh, they really exploded on, on TikTok and it drove a lot of people to their music and brought in a lot of fans. Now, if you look at their TikTok at this moment in time, they have 178,000 followers, 2.3 million likes, a few million views. But even with these uh, seemingly modest numbers with the numbers that are out there, especially considering some of the, my recent guests that I've had, this drove a lot of attention and traffic their way and brought in a lot of real fans. And they're selling out shows now in LA and New York, and they have a tour opening for JP Sachs and an album on the way. This is a very inspiring, interesting story. I very much encourage you to listen to this one all the way to the end. They also have excellent takeaways on what it means to them to make it in the new music business. They really break down their release strategy and what it means to work with partners and team members and how they plan out what music and videos they are going to release in that entire process. If you are working with other musicians or are in a band, uh, they have a really excellent working relationship and I encourage you to listen to how they go about it. As always, please like, subscribe, follow this podcast, however you're listening to it right now. Leave us a five-star review on Spotify. Yes, you can leave reviews on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Please leave us that review. Those really, really help. Leave us a comment on YouTube. I read most of them and respond and try to respond to, to all of them. Find us on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Ari's Take. You can find me, Ari Herstand, on Instagram and Twitter. And visit Ari'sTake.com. Get on that email list. That is the most important thing you can do. That's where we send out all the most relevant information about the new music business and upcoming shows and everything that you need to know there. All right, let's kick into the show. Truesdale, what's up? Welcome to the show. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Thanks for having Hello. us. Hello. Um... So the question that I've been wondering the most over the last um, couple of years, are, do you live together? <laughs> That's a great question. We do not, but we definitely did try that at one point and never again. Okay, because I was, I'm just so <laughs> impressed at how often you're able to put together videos and songs and music and just constant, you have just like this constant stream of stuff that comes out and uh i thought that it was must have been because you live together but okay so you yeah. you got together special for this thank you that's awesome all right <laughs> <laughs> we definitely um i think over the pandemic because we were in each other's circles we really have just spent so much more time with each other because of that yeah. and then also because we don't live together it makes us 
really more excited to hang out when we do. So it's always awesome. fun to hang out. Cool. Well, great. Um, so congratulations on Do Re Mi. It's a it's a great song. It's so fun. Um, it's a uh, it's a banger. And for someone who loves New Orleans, my heart lives in New Orleans. I've spent a lot of time in New Orleans. I write all my books in New Orleans. I someday will live in New Orleans and have a place to have that second line groove, just like pumping through the whole song, like really warmed my Creole Cajun heart so well done on that i want to hear the story behind do re mi oh yeah um okay i got it um <laughs> do re mi was the first song we ever wrote together um so that was like oh, wow seven almost eight years ago now we were freshmen um at usc and mm. lauren and georgia were in a songwriting class together and you guys had just paired up like decided to pair up to write something for an assignment. Mm -hmm. And we all like kind of knew each other, but we weren't close friends yet. And I mm. just remember you guys asking me to come in and add um, a third harmony to it. And we finished the song together and then we just sang it in front of the songwriting class, like patting, patting our knees, singing it a cappella. Um, and it was really just for fun, but people really responded to it and really loved it. And so we've just kept that in our repertoire forever. And mm. I feel like on a whim kind of decided to release it now um, because we had a lot of newer stuff um, yeah. happening, but but we decided to release it. Yeah, I, th I think um, it's been interesting because, you know, we've been singing together for, like Quinn said, like eight years now, and we have so many songs just like backlogged that mm. we haven't ever recorded or released and i think in the last couple of years we've really been kind of going through that old catalog and trying to think like okay like which one of these are now that we're you know actively releasing music like which of these songs do we want to kind of like honor from our past and like mm. our big part of our story moving forward and i think don't worry me is definitely like part of that Nice. And who's Zula? Hey, Georgia. That's a great question. Um, it is somebody that Lauren and I met on the train. Yeah, on the metro. Like the metro, yeah. We were just, I think we had just gotten like pot stickers or something. Mm -hmm. Probably saw a movie, something comforting. And it was late and we met this guy and he was like, my name is Zula. And he was just telling us all these really profound things about life. And it, it just, we heard it in that moment and we were like, all right, well, this happens to be in line with a lot of the stuff we've been talking about tonight with each other, and it made it into our song. And the name of your record label? I know, it's kind of a joke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we just, we were like, oh, we don't, like, you know, we're not yeah. signed artists, so right. we're just like, oh, yeah, Zula Records, like, that's from my yeah. first song we ever wrote, so. Cool, okay, that makes sense, right, so whatever you put in the little, like, who's your record label feels like, eh. Zula Records, that's fine. Right. Got it. Right, right. <laughs> cool. Exactly. Um, well, great. And then um, tell me about how the production came together for a song that's so old, and, and where did the second line groove come from? Do you have connections to New Orleans, or does your producer, or how did this, how did you produce this? Yeah, we, um, so we typically have been really self-producing all of our stuff, um, but on this one and with our previous release, Love, which is also mm -hmm. an older song, um, we brought in some friends to help us with the production just because it's like, they are such old songs and some of them have been, this like, this version that is now released is mm -hmm. like the second or third version of an attempt to record them, and so... Mm. Um, it was really helpful to kind of like bring some fresh ears um, into that process to kind of help us along. Cool. Um, particularly with Do Re Mi, um, just because even like some of the songwriting elements like have changed over the years, like the form of it has gone through a lot of different iterations. Um, but for Do Re Mi, we brought on Devin Hoffman and he that the second line stuff was really kind of like his idea, his brainchild. Cool. And because um, we've always really struggled with trying to figure out what the drum groove should be for that song because mm. there's this Bo Diddley thing going on, but then yep. it's also, yeah, it's all very, it kind of like marries the Bo Diddley with the more like classic folk train beat. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just like such a cool way to do that. Mm -hmm. I'm really grateful to him for 
having that perspective. Mm-hmm. Cool. So the other songs, um, you're saying those are, how did you make those? The I guess the self, um, you said they're mostly self-produced. Is this like the, um, uh, like your couple EPs from last year, uh, What Happiness Is and um, Look Around? Yeah, we um, we self-produced half of Look Around. Okay. And then the other two songs we had done with, with other people. Um, so we did Wouldn't Come Back and Better Off were our productions from the first EP. Mm-hmm. Um, and Happy Anymore we did with this guy Johnny Shore, who's amazing. And oh, yeah. then um, Look Around we did with Noah Hunt and Marissa Esposito. And... Um, and Avi and Avi Kaplan, mm-hmm. yeah, that was super fun. That that was so long ago at this point that we worked on that one, but yeah. Well, um, um, wouldn't come back has been on heavy rotation uh, with me, and it's just like nonstop chills the whole time. The whole song is so dynamic, it's so beautiful. Um, the harmonies, it just for it's incredible. Like I don't know, I want to hear your how you come up with with harmonies and how the song structure it's so interesting to me because those harmonies especially on that song but all your songs they're not your standard parallel thirds and you weave in and out of each other and you bring tension into places that wouldn't necessarily call for it or when you repeat a line you do a totally different harmony the second time around and then if you do it a third time around it's a completely different harmony it's just mind-boggling, but it's so beautiful, and it really hits all the right places. Um, so, yeah, please tell me about the creation process and, and your harmonies and all of that. Oh, well, thank you. Um, we always talk about our arranging process as kind of the second step to the songwriting process. Mm. Um, it's its own separate thing, and we feel like it's just as important um, as writing the song itself. So, and I think that the process is is different every time uh, when we're arranging vocals. Sometimes we kind of arrange it as we're writing it. I mean, we typically will break out into harmony as we're writing stuff anyway. Um, Mm. I feel like a lot of the stuff we write just lends itself to harmony pretty well. Um, And then afterwards, when the song is finished, we tend to go back and get more nuanced with the arrangements. And we do try to change it up uh, with each song too. So sometimes, uh, you know, we'll have one person doing the verse and then we'll be in three part for Mm -hmm. the chorus. Um, And then other times we're all in unison for the verse um, or we've got some like oohs and ahs happening, but it it kind of happens differently every time. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I feel like I, I was really involved with like harmonic stuff at the beginning of like i i love vocal arranging but i feel like as it's progressed we've kind of evolved and we're doing different stuff now we're, we're all very much in the process the whole time hmm. and i feel like that's also why it is different like every song is different um because we're all coming up with different ideas and have our own yeah. tastes uh within it you know yeah yeah cool um yeah, oh, go for it, Lauren, if you wanted to sure. say something. On, oh, yeah, okay. I was just going to add on that. I feel like that also, like, informs the production as well. Um, mm. Because I think my favorite vocal arrangement moments are when we're... It just... It becomes an extension of the songwriting and the production of the song where mm-hmm. we're just, like, adding on these other elements that aren't, like, directly harmonizing a lyric. They're just like mm-hmm. adding to the lyric or yes. it's like a different line altogether that's happening like repetitively in the background and mm-hmm. the listener can kind of like pick out different things at different moments. Or you hold on to a word longer than the other two are holding on to a word, which is so cool because that note just continues through. And yeah, it's great. It's it's like it's the patented Truesdale sound now. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh, it's uniquely yours. It's great. Thank you. I also just wanted to add that I feel like part of it that is part of the magic I think that we feel with each other is that so much of um, some of our arrangements is just in the moment just feeling Mm. each other and being really present Mm. and tapping into our musicality and being like, okay, I don't know why I like this, but this is what it should be. And us all being like, "Mm, yeah, do that. And then it just becomes what we do every time, you know? Mm 
<laughs> Always going for the mm, yeah moments, and then you know mm. you got it. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> That's the goal. That happens a lot with us. <laughs> yeah, I Lots bet. Of, I bet. Mm, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Also, another thing that I was just thinking: we in what happiness is the last EP. Mm-hmm. We recorded a lot of the songs before we had played them because a lot of it happened over the pandemic when we couldn't mm-hmm. be performing, and so that was a different. An interesting process for us to have recorded stuff first and added on the layers and the harmonies and the backgrounds and all of that and then taking it and uh, moving it to something that we can do live and figuring Mm. out the best way to approach it and I think that it's harder in some ways where we're like okay that that doesn't sound the same as it did when we recorded it so we kind of have to shift but I think it also gave us room to try things that we wouldn't have done if we were first arranging it to perform it live sure So it's been a cool process yeah i mean i'm sure a lot of artists have had to kind of restructure their process uh when they're used to trying things out live i mean you know i know uh we're both come from the hotel cafe scene and and just Mm -hmm. like testing things out and doing the songwriter nights or little song sharing sessions here and there all of that where you can feel the reaction in the room and and you can gauge when someone's responding or will you have the room or when there's a moment even in a song that resonates and you feel that in the moment and you take that away with you and you can kind of gauge which songs are uh the ones that people resonate to and which ones maybe are not quite uh the crowd favorites it must be um it must have been challenging to kind of create these songs and then decide how you're going to record them and then if you're even going to put them on the record or if they're any good because no one can you can't really get that feedback yeah i think that that's been interesting for us we really just started releasing music during the pandemic right Mm. yeah so Mm -hmm. we've been a band for so long and only recently started releasing music so we were gauging i feel like interest in songs off of how people reacted live to it Mm -hmm. and it's been interesting to release songs we're building up to like certain songs that we put so much time and love into and we have so much excitement about and then we don't get the same response that maybe we were expecting from listeners um and then other songs that we weren't expecting to get a good response we do and so it Mm. is really interesting when you don't uh you don't have that how are you gauging response from listeners when you're not really able to play many shows or are you talking about the few shows that you are playing these days um i'm more talking about like streaming people listening to the recorded stuff um and then but I i guess also when we're performing live hearing the songs where people are singing the words back to us Mm. and are really responding to um but even like streaming numbers or getting messages from people about songs that really impacted them uh Mm -hmm. i think it's it's interesting to see which ones get more response than others do you notice a difference um when you're performing live the songs that your audience is responding to in the moment versus the ones that they're responding to because of Spotify or because of the recordings? I feel like, oh yeah, Georgia, you go. Well, I was just gonna say with um, just one, a specific one, when we performed at the Echo a few months back and Mm -hmm. one of the first songs we played was Happy Anymore, which was our, was that the first original song we released? Um, And, that song was, mm-hmm. it, it did well enough, and um, mm-hmm. but we had so many people singing those words back to us, and I remember that being a very cool. surreal moment of, I was not expecting that. Just based off of like looking at our numbers online, mm-hmm. um, like mm-hmm. streaming numbers with that song versus other ones. Yeah, yeah just to add on to that, I feel um, like, maybe before Happy Anymore was released, if we had been playing that at a show, it's a pretty mellow song. Mm. Um, and so like it probably wouldn't get like as big of a response um, as it does now that people can listen to the recorded version. Um, just because I think that there are different elements that people look for in a live performance versus a recording. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, if it's a recorded version, like you 
can capture just such nuance and at like such a high level of detail mm. um particularly just being like literally being able to hear the lyrics um in a mm -hmm. recording versus mm -hmm. you know relying on the sound at a show and people talking around you and all that stuff mm -hmm. um so i think the recorded version gives people a chance to kind of like become a fan of the song so that at the show maybe their ears are a little bit more you know ready to hear it mm -hmm. versus like at a live show you know it's like so much of it is just about energy mm -hmm. in the room totally so what inspired you to release music when you did in 2021 after being a band for what six year five six years already performing why hadn't you released music prior to that and why then yeah totally that's a great question i think we had never we had recorded a lot of songs that we had written over the years with mm. a variety of different producers and we're all three individual opinionated people and so we never fully felt like super excited about anything that any recorded version of the songs that we had previous to actually taking our music into our own hands and producing ourselves. Mm -hmm. And over the past couple of years, Lauren had been really honing in her production skills. And mm -hmm. so her, she kind of allowed us to be like, all right, well, we have the freedom now to take these songs into our own hands. Mm -hmm. And then we had so much time over the pandemic and we had so much music that we loved. We were just like, it's now or never, let's just go for it. <laughs> and I think it was kind of a blessing in disguise for us. Yeah. Um, so I want to talk about that a little bit of the your time over the pandemic, because there were, I feel like people went on one end of the extreme or the other. Uh, some people went a million miles a minute and was just like, got to create, got to make, got to do this, got to push through, You're like the world's ending, but I got to, you know, I'm on that end of the spectrum. It seems like you guys are on that end of the spectrum too. And then there's the other end of the spectrum. It's just like, I'm going to binge every single show on Netflix and I'm not going to do anything else. And that's it because the world's ending. So fuck it all the hell. And I feel like, you know, but it's also like, it's it was, it was very scary, especially for artists that thrived live to not to have that ripped away and to then have this identity crisis of who am i i don't have my community my physical community i don't have i'm not the ability to perform has just been unceremoniously stripped from me without my consent and i just have to now suffer through this but you guys went a completely different way and started TikTok, um, you know, uh, what, end of 2020 or so at the end of the year and thrived. I mean, it like, I feel like it was like your third video got a million views and then it just kind of kept going and it started all of this. Um, tell me, tell me what, what you were feeling throughout all of this and like why you decided to get on TikTok and that whole journey, because it's, it's so interesting to me and, and all the other artists out there that are just like, what the fuck is TikTok? How do you do this as a musician? And you've really succeeded. I've been very impressed at, at how you've grown on TikTok and, and just oh, everything you, you do on it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that us really like hunkering down and starting to work and record a lot was, timing i feel like it wasn't really a decision where we were like all right we're going to take this time and make the most mm. of it i feel like we're constantly trying to do that we have been for years um before this all happened but we all um have separate jobs we're all trying to make money um in other ways right now because this you know doing this band right now is not financially supporting us yet mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and so we were just so busy before uh, that I feel like having everything slow down just gave us more hours in the day to be mm -hmm. working. And we love it so much that I think it just happened. Um, we didn't force ourselves to do that. I think it just naturally, it naturally happened. And with TikTok, um, I just, I watch TikTok uh, way too much. I have okay. since since that around that time when we started making them because i was just seeing a lot of people releasing 
music or just promoting their music or just singing at a keyboard. And uh, I think it's just a really cool place to find new people in a way that we couldn't before. Um, mm -hmm. And so I just thought we need to take advantage of that because we are primarily, well, we were at the time primarily a live band. Mm -hmm. I figured like that's that's the best way for us to do this now that we can't mm -hmm. be singing in front of people. Mm -hmm. And we enjoy doing that so much, just live, um, raw, unedited stuff that, uh, yeah, I feel like that was just the time to start taking advantage of that. And it, we did get a really good response from TikTok. And so we just kept doing it. But I mean, that is it is also a very up and down thing. Like you could have mm -hmm. a video that's viral or it gets a ton of views and you get a really big response from it and then up for an entire month after that you you don't and mm -hmm. so it is uh it's a risky and tricky thing i think TikTok. yeah it definitely is i feel like just to answer your question um more geared towards why and how we kind of like kept our energy going through the pandemic was just like we have such a micro community just within the three of us i can't imagine i mean we say this all the time even just normally but like it's so like any one of us could have a solo career like we're all like we all write out by by ourselves and we you know love doing our own music but it's just it's a hard road like being an artist is like requires a lot of sacrifice and a lot of work and having the support of two other people doing it with you is just like so mm. helpful in so many moments and i think this is just one of them like if i was just doing my solo project through the pandemic i totally understand how i probably would just be not doing anything because it's just hard it's just mm -hmm. really tough um, so I think just like our relationship is like with each other is like a testament to how we were able to kind of like keep going through that. And, um, and that's still to say, like, we definitely still have our moments where we're like, we take a break from Truesdale. I feel like our holidays are very, like, we don't see or even really like talk to each other that much, like for like a month or so, like over the holidays. And like, that's very intentional because, mm -hmm. um, we all kind of like need that break and at the beginning of the pandemic i mean yeah we weren't seeing each other for probably the first four or five months uh -huh. um i think there's just like so much pressure not only that artists put on themselves but just like people in general like mm. the normal average grind culture mm -hmm. that like everyone deals with i think it can be so hard on on people that feel like they didn't take advantage of the pandemic or like they're mm. they're telling themselves that story Mm. Yeah, no, I mean, that that makes a lot of sense. Um, and it is important to remember for all of us, and especially people listening, that we're not as productive as you were, to not be so hard on ourselves. Uh, yeah. It was a very challenging time. It still is, as shows are still getting canceled and rescheduled, as you know, firsthand. It sucks. And, and it it's... Um, you know, we have to just keep moving forward and, and not beat ourselves up about about things that are completely out of our control. And even some things that seemingly are in our control, uh, there it's, it's not necessarily something that um, everyone has the um, ability or endurance to just manage uh, as well as everyone else. And, and you know, Theodore Roosevelt said the comparison is the thief of joy. And it's like as we're constantly bombarded with comparisons to our friends and our peers through social media, it can be very easy to beat ourselves up when we feel we're not comparing to uh, the productivity of others around us. But we're human and artists, and it's important to, um, you know, just... Um, do self-care in whatever way that makes sense um, for, for each of us. Yes. Yes, I totally agree. And I just to add to that, I feel like listening to your body and trusting that mm. if, if your body is like, no, I cannot write a song today or I need to just, I'm not okay. Like, I got to mm. take a break. To listen to that and to trust that those are the moments that are only going to 
fuel your creativity. Fuel your creativity, absolutely. Mm, and that yes. like it'll be there waiting for you when mm. when you want to come back to it. It's not you're not going to scare it away or it's yeah, it's it's there, you know, mm -hmm. and you're allowed to hibernate. Mm -hmm. mm. Absolutely. And it's, it's an important reminder uh, that a as artists and uh, creative people that yes, I love that it'll be there when you need it. And and that's, that's really important to remember. Um, because of the reaction you were seeing from TikTok, did that inspire you to finally release music? Yes, I think for me personally, obviously, we all have different opinions. Sure. But um, I would say, Quinn's push to do TikTok was so helpful in me personally remembering that people are interested in what we have to say and that mm. there's something here that we believe in, that it's always affirming to get a positive reaction from people other than each other. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I would say for me, definitely, it was like, oh, great. Okay, well, we've got some fire going, even though we can't go out and do anything. <laughs> there's mm. some fire in the online world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I feel like as as much as I think it's another part of what another part that's so great about having three people uh, for me is that I have no shame in being like, yeah, we're amazing. It's like a lot easier <laughs> to do that when they're, when it's not just you Yeah. to be like, yeah, we well, have something very cool happening here because I look up to and respect Lauren and Georgia so much, too, that mm. like that feels like it's a part of it. Um, but it is nice to have people that you don't know and that didn't know you before mm. um validating the the work and the time and the love that you're you're putting into something and being mm. impacted by it and i i think that tiktok has definitely done that we've gotten a lot of new people uh that are listening to our music that wouldn't have and wouldn't have found us before yeah um yeah and i think that's that's definitely helped i think it was just kind of an organic natural thing because we were in the midst of recording uh, would our cover of wouldn't it be nice and wouldn't come back when we started filming TikToks, mm. um, and so it it happened at a good time as well when we really were starting to release material that people could actually click on and listen mm -hmm. to besides just the videos. Mm -hmm. um, but it's definitely it's definitely a nice little like fire to to know that people are are listening and are excited to hear what's coming next. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, I'm curious about your release strategy as independent artists without a record label. Um, how do you go about releasing music and, and who is independent, uh, independent company? I read a little bit based out of Echo Park. Um, I think their tagline, uh, I wrote it down. It said, where's their tagline? Something about, um, oh, the record label alternative established in 2020 uh what what is this who are they and and yeah give me your whole kind of release strategy yeah um so independent i'm pretty sure it used to be a management company called indie okay. pop and okay. then mm. in the last couple of years they have kind of migrated into becoming more of a distribution company with label services mm. um and we were introduced to them through our manager a couple of years ago. And we signed with them for the first EP. Um, and they just have a, they have a great team over there. Gabe Lister kind of runs the whole thing. And at least he's like our label contact. Mm -hmm. Sure. And um, there's a marketing end and a DSP end. And mm -hmm. we kind of have a team meeting every week where we go over anything that needs to be talked about with releases and strategy and such um and we we signed on to do the second ep with them as well um but yeah they've been great it's been an awesome like in between of like we still retain the rights to all of our masters and mm -hmm. recordings mm -hmm. and um we have that support when we need it um especially for the dsps i think that's been really important for us that that has more than anything informed our release strategy i would say um what has just independent that, or the dsps uh the just the dsps and how oh, okay. they treat a release got it um because we've always said you know whenever you have a release which could be you know 
like an album, an EP, or a single. Like all of those things are considered a quote unquote release. Mm-hmm. Um, and they only, sp- particularly Spotify, and I'm not sure about Apple Music, but I know that Spotify, um, you have to choose one song per release to mm-hmm. pitch to playlists, um, the Spotify editors. And mm-hmm. so because of that, we never wanted to feel like we were putting out songs, you know, as baby artists. Um, we never wanted to feel like we were putting out a song that wasn't going to be getting the attention or the push that it could have mm. just because it was part of a larger body of work. Yes. Um, which is annoying, you know, like yeah. obviously yeah. like bodies of work are really cool in different ways, but also attention spans are short and, you know, the pitch, uh, system that Spotify has like really has informed, um, our strategy for doing kind of like single releases mm-hmm. every time kind mm-hmm. of accumulating into an EP. Um, I'm not really sure how that, now that we have more of a following, I'm, it'll be interesting to see how that changes like with mm-hmm. our release strategy moving forward. I think we're still kind of reflecting on that, but that's kind of where our heads have been at. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Um, who's your manager and how did you partner up and link up with them? <clears throat> our manager is Niels Gums, and he is a great guy. He came to our show at the Hotel Cafe, actually. Mm. Yeah. That's how we met him. And he came up to us after the show and was like, oh, my God, you guys are you know, amazing. I want to work with you. And at the time, we were working with him and uh, one of his partners. And then we ended up just working with Niels, and we've been working with him ever since. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cool. And um, he made the the connection to independent, and I'm, I'm assuming you guys are kind of put your heads together when it comes to release strategy. Or what's the relationship like in terms of who's doing what in the manager artist relationship? Mm, yeah. Um, yeah. He's a, he's a part of the strategizing in the same way with independent. Like we're we're okay. all on our weekly meetings together. And I think, yeah, everyone kind of plays a part in it and coming up with different ideas and timelines for things. Mm -hmm. And I would say between the three of us, there are already a lot of cooks in the kitchen. So we are definitely quite opinionated about how we want to go about strategy and releases. And often we're also uh, usually trying to catch up. We're like we're running behind on like deadlines trying to catch up that we've made for ourselves you know um but yeah i think that we're we all kind of uh throw in our ideas and we're not uh i don't think we ever will be the type of artists to follow like a set of rules that are given to us um whether that's like release strategy or what kinds of songs to release or what type of production or who to work with. Yeah. Um, we, we very much like to be in full control every single step of the way. (laughs) Yeah. I would say that's, I mean, that's great. And that's so important. I mean that Mm -hmm. it's like the artists that lose control and just, I guess, give up all the decision-making to, the their their business partners whether that's a manager or a label or a distributor or whomever uh those are the ones who very quickly not just lose control of projects but of their entire career and mm-hmm. artists need to stay in control i mean you you know as an artist you are the ceo of your project and you don't want to forget that everyone on your team works for you and they answer to you. And, and I think artists oftentimes lose track of that and they forget that all the business people around, they don't have anything without the artists. They don't have a product. They, they have nothing without artists, but they're very good at convincing artists that the artists need them when it's really the other way around. Um, but more so, you know, if you find a great partner um, then it it feels like a partnership and it doesn't feel like there uh, is a hierarchy or that someone is working for someone else. It, you want it to feel like a, a, a real tight, beautiful partnership. Um, and that's how everyone on the team should be, regardless of their job title. It's You're all partners together on the same mission together. 
Totally, totally. I think that that's um, something, I mean, I feel very lucky. I feel like our entire team kneels and independent. Uh, Mm. It feels like we are all working together towards something. And Mm -hmm. I think that that's another plus of having three of us. We have the validation between the three of us to know that like, okay, we, we have the choice here. We Mm -hmm. do have the control. And I think it would, for me, at least it would be a lot harder as just, um, do it, just doing it myself. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think we are lucky with the team that we have They're uh, they do listen to us and they hear us and they understand our vision and believe in it. And if we're like, no, 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 we don't want to do that. We're switching gears. We want to do something else. Mm -hmm. They're all like, okay, all right, that's it. And yeah, I think that that has informed us and we have a standard and expectations Mm -hmm. moving forward as Mm -hmm. we continue to build new relationships with people of like, that's, that's what we need. Uh, nice. Always. That's great. That's great. And it's a really strong foundation uh, to build on. And as you grow and as you bring on more partners, more team members uh, to understand yourselves and how you work to that extent, it's going to be very easy to grow your team because at the core, you know who you are and how decisions are made and how you function and operate. And then people will come into your world and on your team and they'll very quickly understand that this is how it works and it'll make sense to them or it won't. And that's okay because as long as you have this strong foundation laid and you have the strong core, you're gonna be fine and you're gonna attract people that want to work in that situation. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm hog- I'm going to pass the mic in a second. I'm okay. hogging it. But um, I think that the fact that we hadn't released music for so long mm. uh, was a really good thing for us because we were a band and we were friends for so many years leading up to us being more uh, in the hands of like the public and other people. Mm-hmm. And we had time to build that foundation. And I feel like we had a really strong sense of who we were. And I think we're learning so much especially now that we have music out in the world and we're meeting new people and building new relationships like there's so much more to learn but i think because we spent those years learning about each other and like and building that relationship i feel like it gave us yeah just a a way stronger Mm. sense of of who we were i think it was really helpful awesome no that's great um yeah um so i want to uh take it back to TikTok a little bit. It's the hottest thing right now and all the artists are wondering how it's done. And, you know, I, I, I've i had a lot of TikTok people on the show. Um, we just had, I mean, we've had a couple influencer marketers, like people who run influencer marketing agencies. We just had Griffin Hadwell on the program, who's the CEO of Vertical. Of the top 10 songs on the Billboard 200 right now, they are working five of them. Um, And so they run the campaigns and create the trends uh, for the ones that catch and go viral for the, they primarily work with major labels and the pop stars. Uh, We had Flight House on, Austin George is from Flight House, who they do a similar thing. I just had Justin Vibes on. He's got eight and a half million TikTok followers. He's a jazz vibraphonist and he just like has grown crazy. And had Ricky Montgomery on, who he had two songs go viral on TikTok before he was even on the platform. Like his songs independently released from five years prior caught fire uh, as a sound on TikTok. He wasn't even on it. He was getting texts from friends being like, yo, I think this is your song that there are people doing like means to. And so it's such an interesting space. It's very exciting to me because it's the first time in the history of social media where things are not necessarily dependent on how many followers you have and that they can just catch very quickly outside of your immediate community. Um, And so I'm curious about your approach, both as creators on the platform and how you approach it, and then also how you use it to promote your music. Yeah, that's a great question. Oh my gosh, TikTok is such a crazy animal. It's really hard to <laughs> to keep track of. I feel like anyone 
that has ever asked me or us advice about TikTok and like what to do, like people, particularly people who aren't on it. I mean, like we always just say, like start posting. It literally like doesn't have to be put together. It doesn't have to be polished. It just has to be authentic. And I think that's the most important thing is to just start posting, start like sharing anything mm. um, and like copy trends that you see. You know, if you see like a musician doing like a parody of this riff challenge or or whatever, the, or like we have a couple of friends that do like they'll ask people to comment a day of the year and then they'll like share a voice memo of like the song that they wrote on that day of the year mm. with a couple of friends that do that. Cool. Um, so there's, yeah, there's just like a million different ideas of, of content that people are putting out consistently. And um, I think you have to find what works for you and what feels the most um, authentic to you. Mm. I think that's really important to just like, no one's going to have fun. Like, your fans aren't going to enjoy it, and you're not going to enjoy it if you are not excited by your own content. Yes. Mm. Um, so mm. if that means, like, putting in a lot of time into a video until it looks perfect and, you know, pristine and you're really excited about it, then do that. But if it also is, like, a seven-second video of you giggling at yourself, like, film, <laughs> like filming your friend <laughs> or something, then, like, do that. Um, like we've been experimenting with that recent, more recently of just like the three of us individually posting to our TikTok a lot more, um, mm -hmm. a, just to feed the algorithm, but B also it just like shows that we're real people and that, yeah. you know, we joke around and we're friends and, um, like we actually just recently did, um, a cover of what dreams are, or the yeah. Lizzie what McGuire, what dreams are made of. And but before we posted hey the the I know it's called Hey Now I don't know yeah. whatever you know what we're talking about. <laughs> Lizzie yeah. McGuire Hillary Lizzie Duff McGuire. we love it yeah. um but we before we posted the final cover we posted a clip of us just joking around in the bathroom like trying to figure out like where we were gonna sit and like Quinn was on a squatty potty and it was like all very funny and it was just, it's just like all like classic stuff that happens whenever we're yeah. trying to film a TikTok <laughs> and we posted that first and that was like actually pretty competitive with how the yeah. actual cover did because people were just like they just like to see something funny and they wanted to learn what a squatty potty was and your explanation exactly. of it was fantastic because it was <laughs> it was a very authentic moment of one person uses it regularly and understands the majesty of it and the other has no idea that these things even exist and that whole thing went right down it was like oh wow this is great <laughs> very informative <laughs> I feel like I convinced you <laughs> that the squatting potty was like a really worthy investment, right? I feel like I'll buy one now. <laughs> I'll buy one for you as a gift, maybe. You're yeah, going to be the I first would... band that gets endorsed by squatting potty. I would <laughs> love <laughs> that. That would be amazing. I feel like getting, yeah, getting sponsored by something like squatty potty. Right on brand. <sighs> That's the dream. On Poopery brand. and squatty potty. Wow, double, <laughs> double bathroom <That's>, branding. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to add, you know, Ari, I have to say, of the ladies in this band, I am probably the least excited about TikTok, just because okay. it gives Thank me you. so much, like, not 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 in a way of, like, I don't think that we should do it, but just in a way of, like, mm -hmm. oh, it gives me just no enjoyment. Mm -hmm. But I think what does give me enjoyment is singing together. And so mm -hmm. it's very easy to just be like, well, what's our favorite thing to do? Freaking sing a song that we all love together. Mm. And then we post it, and and that's really what I feel like is, you know, the best part of it for me. But definitely these ladies have guided the TikTok journey, and I'm just like, all right, well, here we go. <laughs> I think <TikTok>. there's a little <laughs> TikTok. <laughs> I think there's a little of uh, Georgia in all of us. Um, I think that... <laughs> Right. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> in many ways, more ways than one, but, but it, more so with the, with our, with our resistance to yet another social platform that we have to focus on and take seriously. And, you know, I talk to artists every day that 
struggle with this and even just finding the inspiration of of needing to post and what am I going to post and I don't want to do this and then they post a video that they spend way too long on and it gets 37 views and they're like fuck this what is this this is nothing I'm not da, da, da. you know so right. I, I feel that and I think a lot of people listening feel that intimately uh, yeah. It's nice to hear that from you, f- who is part of a group that is really yeah. exploded um, and had a lot of success on TikTok, uh, relatively. And it's it's um, it's it's nice to hear that. So I appreciate you saying yeah. that, Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's definitely just a job. I think that's yeah. part of it too. Is like we just started to really treat it like, you know. Mm -hmm. it's sometimes Mm -hmm. you don't want to do it sometimes you don't want to show up at work but like you just it's you gotta clock in exactly Mm. um and sometimes it ends up being fun and sometimes it's like the last thing i want to do right now is (laughs) film a tiktok video Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) there have been so many times where we do end up posting something that in the end we're really excited about Mm -hmm. but we do like okay well there are some times where we can't stop laughing (laughs) <laughs> like yeah i would say yeah 50 of the time that happens and we cannot stop laughing and we finally get like a good enough take where we're not laughing mm-hmm. and then in, and other times we'll be often in here and we're exhausted and we've already done a full day of working on other stuff and we're like okay we're not going to see each other for like four days and we're not going to have anything to post like we should really just do a quick cover of something and yeah. i feel like we're uh miserable we're miserable when we're doing it and we're like trying to get the tripod to stand up correctly and like get the angle and then like we're accidentally clicking the wrong buttons and everyone's annoyed and we do it over and over and it's like not quite right and we're like i'm just done like let's just post it we're like no one more like we can get it right and there's a lot of that um but then a a lot of those videos we will end up posting and people really love them and it's worth it Mm. and i think with like not putting in all of the work and having a video that you spent so much time on that goes nowhere and gets so few views i like to think of it as um just having a body of work that you can look back on and be proud of even if people don't see it Mm. it doesn't mean that in two months you don't get a video that gets a lot of views and people end up looking through your page and finding that video yes you know finding something that they they really love and that you're really proud of. And so I think even if you don't get the views on it when you post mm. it, it I, I think that that can really make it difficult to continue posting. But mm-hmm. if you have something that you can look back on and you're proud of and you want to show people, I think yes. it's worth it regardless. I feel like that's a good metaphor for life, Quinn. Oh my, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Georgia. Yes. I feel like it's, also like a really good exercise for artists to be a little bit less precious about Mm. the songs you do or the content you're putting out is because it's just like yes yeah it's a good exercise to just be like oh yeah this is just one thing i'm working on today you know it doesn't have to be like like the only thing that's ever going to represent everything you do it's Mm -hmm. like and that we're not always great all the time Like, it kind of offers a little bit of real life to it. Like, I'm going to join in over Sometimes here. we're just really bad. <laughs> we have some viral videos that, like, I still cringe at when I oh, listen to them. Oh, God. Yeah, God. definitely. Mm-hmm. But uh, people still liked it. Yeah. yeah. I, that, <laughs> those are all really great points. And it's it's nice to to put that in perspective. But also, yes, not being so precious is so important when it comes to this kind of a... Uh, medium because as artists we don't want to put stuff into the world unless it's perfect that's the record making process but it's like I think I almost equate it to to kind of songwriter sharing sessions or songwriter nights when you get up it's like you know what you're it's a time to test things out and things might not always be done it might not always be perfect in the moment but that's this is the forum for that this is the medium and in this space, I test things. And people are comfortable doing that in like a song sharing session or at a songwriter night or something like that. And this is kind of the forum for that to test it. And the beautiful thing about it is that if you hate it, you can delete it. And if it um, if it's not great or it doesn't, it, if the algorithm doesn't catch it, no one sees it. So it's not like, I mean, it's like the algorithm will crush it. So it's not like, 
Instagram where you're worried when you put something on there that you're follow you're going to get unfollowed because you put something that isn't quote on brand or that people aren't going to respond to it because like oh wow I don't like I'm not here for this content and you put something on Instagram and and then you get unfollowed for posting you know content that your followers aren't here for or don't appreciate whereas on TikTok if you post something that your followers don't appreciate they're just not even going to see it because the algorithm is going to crush it so I mean Lauren you make a great point about don't being so precious about it because it's just like no one's going to see it if it doesn't catch and do well. So you might as well just keep throwing stuff at the wall and see what does stick. And I think like you were talking about following trends and I wanted to hit that a little bit because I think that's what catches and holds up a lot of artists is they don't want to participate in these seemingly manufactured trends that aren't necessarily uh, relatable to them. However, the way that you approach trends is very inspiring because it is very patently you, patently Truesdale, which is which is really cool because like it's you take a trend but you make it your own. And so scrolling through your your feed and, and watching all your past videos, nothing sticks out there as this sounds harsh, but this is the fear that most artists has. Nothing sticks out as desperation. Nothing sticks out to me as in you are desperate to catch a trend wave and so you did some dumb dance that everyone was doing or you did some stupid trend that like is not you and that was forced. It does feel everything is authentically you. Even the videos that got 33 views, uh, Quinn, I do have to thank you for uh, the rake and shake curly hair routine. As you can say, I, I, I did it in full force today. Uh <laughs> I was going to ask. Need, you don't need that. You've got, you've got the natural <laughs> curls just absolutely. Oh, but believe you me, I was... I was raking and shaking this shit before. I was like, you know what? I got to Quinn, I got to show her that she taught me well. <laughs> They're gorgeous. Thanks. <laughs> so, but like, I mean, all of that, I don't think that was a trend, but necessarily it was like, you know, um, when you did Adele's cover, the Easy On Me, and I know everyone was doing the Easy On Me cover, you, all, you just did a little course, but it was you. And so if someone, if the first video that they found, uh, first video that they saw of yours was... Easy Ami was the Adele cover, and that's what welcomed them into your world. It made sense. It wasn't like you did this super cool coordinated dance routine, and then they entered through that and like, oh, wait, they're not dancers? Oh, this doesn't make any sense. I don't connect with this. I, I thought I was going to get more dance videos. They're singers? What is this? But the fact that you jump on trends that make sense to you, and then you make it your own, that is something that I think a lot of artists would appreciate to just see and understand that it is still authentically you. It is not chasing. It is still leading. Even though you're participating in these trends, you're still leading because you're making it your own. Mm. Thank you for saying that. I think um, with Easy On Me, for example, or any of the songs that I don't really know what the trends are, but the songs that you'll be like, this is trending, mm -hmm. Quinn, I'm looking at. <laughs> um, I think, again, it's another situation where we're lucky because there's three of us and we mm. already have such a sound when the three of us are just singing anything together. We don't even have mm -hmm. to be intentional or thoughtful about it. It's just like naturally when three voices sing together, it's like, okay, well, there's a, there's a dip sound, you know? Mm -hmm. But I think when it comes to taking something and trying to make it our own, there's an element of really finding what it is that we all three individually and together really love about that song. Even mm. if it's a, a trend of a song that we don't really love or feel like is really us, if we can just find one thing that we really do love and focus on that and find the right key so all of our voices have that click. Mm -hmm. um, I know we did, a, we did a Jackson Brown song. Mm -hmm. What I can't remember what it was called. Was it These Days? Yeah. These Days these days like that wasn't a trend but or old man it's like sir or easy on me like sometimes mm -hmm. we'll we'll hit that sweet spot of the right key and the right everybody's like in their pocket we really can quickly arrange something when quinn's on the bottom lauren's melody and i'm on top and it mm. usually always locks pretty effortlessly mm -hmm. um and then the more intricate arrangements like the yeba song yeah, the evergreen, evergreen we like we're switching parts and that's yeah. a whole other challenge but 
I would say just finding the song, the parts of the songs that we all really are inspired by and like to sing will immediately give us, uh, it will immediately become our own. So mm -hmm. like for other people, maybe just finding those those parts in those songs that are trending that they really, really love mm -hmm. and what hits them about it or mm -hmm. changing the chords up or whatever it is that's yeah. going to make them really inspired by it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've done that a few times too of just like, we call it countryfying something yeah. <laughs> where um, like we just did that with Mama Who Bore Me. Yeah. Where... Okay, thank you for. Uh, I all right. I'm a huge Spring Awakening fan. I freaked out when I saw that. I saw it on Broadway. I know every word of every song in the soundtrack. I lived on that shit for like two years. So thank you for doing that. That was very <laughs> exciting for me. Was is that a trend? Did I miss this, or did you just decide we're gonna do a Spring Awakening song, which is so random? Um, I love spring awakening when was in i yeah when i was in high school sorry my hands oh, no sweaty, shit. touched your face um <laughs> i was the broadway version yeah the broadway version i was right. in a community theater version of um spring awakening but i love oh, the yeah. show yeah um love the music so mm -hmm. much and we just got i think like two comments on another tiktok where like separate people mm. being like you guys should do mama who bore me and I, I think we do get a lot of ideas from people commenting of things that they think would fit. And I was like, absolutely, yes. And then once we started, you were playing it on guitar and it really, oh, here I'll you tell go. tell the truth. Lauren d really didn't want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I really didn't want to do it. But here's my deep cut thing is I love Duncan <laughs> Sheik. Right. And I, oh, yeah. he has this song called Half Life that I like listened mm -hmm. to in high school. And it's like such a meaningful song to me. And so, like, I've always been a fan of his, and obviously mm -hmm. he did the the music for that musical. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, "All right, we're gonna if we're gonna do this song, we gotta like spice it up a little bit." Because George was over here doing her like, "Mama, who's yeah. born me?" <laughs> like that, right? <laughs> and I'm over here being like, "Absolutely not." <laughs> so then I start swinging the guitar, and then it feels right. a little bit better. Yeah, yeah. it was a good, nice. it was a good merge, and I think um just going off of that like what we take to make our own with trends i think we also all just mm. have an intuitive filter that we go through of like when we see trends and we see things that are really popular mm -hmm. but uh, kind of going off what you were saying georgia if like if it doesn't click with us if we don't love the trend that's happening I, we won't even have a conversation about it mm. but um i think we also just can immediately know what might be organic to us and sometimes we'll try things that we don't end up posting and um like i'll have a list of like brainstorm ideas that often like 80 percent of them we don't do but i think we have no, not, i just or like things that i write down where like i see something that's really cool and i like go to my yeah. notes and I'm like do this really weird thing and then i look I back it. later and i'm like wow absolutely not that's not a good <laughs> idea but we just i think we have a filter too with it of sure. we, we decide also because of the lack of time we like pick our favorite things and our mm, favorite mm -hmm. songs that are trending or are not and i think that makes it easier to make it our own yeah do you have content batching days do you plan out on your calendar we're getting together to do tiktoks today or how does this work well ari you'd be glad to know that uh we actually recently made it a very official uh note on our shared note of the dates that we will be releasing different TikToks and the songs for the whole month of February. And we will be recording them in advance and we've already done all three for next week. Am I right, ladies? Yes. So yeah. it's very Muzzle organized, tough. but it never was before. But what'd you say? I said Mazel Tov. That's great. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> it never has been before, yeah. but yep. uh, we're trying something new because I think we realize how much time we waste by like doing them on different days. And then it's literally just like yeah. the 30 minutes that it takes to figure out where we're going to put the iPhone, get the lighting right, get mm -hmm. the recording sounding good. It's just like it's a whole process. So, mm -hmm. yeah, we, we are going to start trying to like pre-record at least a good amount of them. Nice.
It's great. Smart. Awesome. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for all of that breakdown on uh, your your how you approach TikTok. I know everyone appreciates that. And that is something that um, I feel like the artists that were resistant the first couple of years who thought it was just teenagers dancing are finally kind of coming around to realizing like, oh, this this actually my fans are on here so I can find them and this is can be a way that I can connect in a different way um, and I, th- I think it's it's very inspiring to see how you've approached it and it's inspiring to see that in just a year's time you went from zero to a couple hundred thousand followers with millions upon millions of views that then naturally translated into the growth of your music because sometimes you don't see that crossover and the fact that Yeah, you're building on TikTok because it's so authentically you, because you're integrating your original songs too. Those people translate over to Spotify. That's probably one of the big reasons that you have so much success on Spotify with the with the official playlist is because they're getting these signals. Like they they get these signals from when they see that a lot of people are coming there to look you up and to play you, that tips them off that something's happening. And the fact that you are putting so much effort over here on TikTok, it naturally translates over to Spotify. So now I wanna ask what is What's coming this year? What is happening 2022? I know that you had a tour with JP Sachs, another hotel cafe staple. Uh, is that still happening? I know that some of the dates got rescheduled. What's going on with that? Yes, all that is still happening. Great. Uh, we are leaving next week, actually, to do our first date with JP Hell yeah. in Chicago. Cool. And yeah, we're all very, very excited about that. We love we love JP Sachs. Um, and then how did that come the- to be? I think just through our agent or yes, our booking agent, Ethan, who's great. Also, we covered one of his songs on TikTok and he saw us and I think had heard us and seen us because of that, that song. Tiki Taki. Tiki Taki. Tiki Taki. Nice. Yeah. I think, I think that's like partially, and we were being considered for um, some dates last year, and um, we ended up not being the ones to go mm-hmm. with him. And then because of COVID, I think a few dates got canceled and moved. Yep. And because of that, we actually now got the opportunity to open for him. So that's awesome. Yeah, we're super stoked. Minneapolis is the only one that got canceled. But Which we, I was so bummed to dates. see because that you were playing my old home, the Varsity Theater, which I've played more than literally anyone on planet Earth. I used to have a weekly residency there. Uh, oh my I gosh. used to, that's, that's like my home. When you go, when you do go play the Varsity Theater because it's rescheduled. I think uh, I think an old poster of mine. It's massive because they used to make these giant posters. I think they actually like paper mache it to the wall when you're walking up the stairs to the bathrooms. I think oh, it, I think you'll God. see like a a baby 19 year old Ari up on the side of the wall. So you'll have to take a photo of that and send okay, it to me. Okay, yeah, we'll we'll search for you and take a <laughs> selfie with it. Yeah, yeah, good, good. <laughs> Amazing. Um, um, sorry, but yeah, sh- oh, go ahead. We we're gonna say what else was happening this year. Oh, yeah. What else is happening this year? Well, um, we are going to start recording and producing our first album. All right. We're very excited about. Nice. Yes, we have about seven songs that we are 100% sure is going to be on it. And then we're still working on the other ones. But um, yeah, we're really excited. Cool. Very exciting. Amazing. Well, Ladies, this has been so great. Thank you so much for coming and chatting. Um, I have one final question that I ask everyone who comes on the show. What does it mean to you to make it in the new music business? I'm sure we'll all have different answers. Mm. Yeah. Quinn, start Um, us off. I think for me, because we are not um, making money, enough money to live off of right now, To me, I would say it would be a combination of being able to financially support yourself Mm. with your music, um, doing what you love, loving the music that you're doing, um, being able to have creative control and work with people that you want to work with. Mm. um, And I think being able to have a positive impact on people, having a platform to help people. Nice. Wonderful. Georgia. 
I could not agree with you more on that. I think that's a great answer, Quinn. And I love this question, Ari. I think mine is number one, to be able to connect with as many people as possible mm. um, and create art to the highest quality that we can and with like enough resources and financial help and to not have to work at a day job to be able to do music. Mm -hmm. And also I would say um, to be able to work with people that I really admire and mm. really would never get a chance to work with unless there was some thing larger that happened where mm -hmm. we were really seen. Yeah. Shout out to Ethan Greska. <laughs> <laughs> a dream collab. Nice. Yeah. Um, I agree with both of you guys. I, it's funny, I, as you guys were answering, I was just thinking like, no one asks other people that, you know, if you're like, what does it mean to make it as a lawyer? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like it's kind of an interesting question when you phrase mm -hmm. it that mm -hmm. way. Um, because and everyone it's like, has a different answer. And that's the right. most interesting thing about music. Yeah. Yeah, it's so interesting. I think just that whole idea of making it is such mm -hmm. a, a myth in some way because it's like we are all artists and musicians and that just mm -hmm. is but making it i think has so many like cultural implications attached to it and um acknowledging those i would totally say it's like a financial thing for me it's like being mm. able to just support myself and do music i think is just the biggest thing and i think that involves variety and um mental health and mm. community and just kind of these bigger elements of like creating a life around yourself that you can feel content with like going to bed at night mm -hmm. um but yeah that's that's what i would say yes georgia i just had one more thought i think that also the idea of making it is that um for me believing that my idea of making it is gonna change as different things happen mm. and letting the dreams and aspirations continue with each phase. Mm. That after we are able to pay rent, you know, maybe our dream is gonna be, or our idea of making it is gonna be something different, mm. but totally. letting ourselves just be on the journey. Love that. Love it, love it. Lauren Georgia Quinn, Truesdale, thank you so much, this is great. Thank you so Thanks much for, for having, having us. us. <laughs> <laughs> Love you. <You're> the best. <laughs> Thanks.